Hello everybody and welcome back. Today's lesson, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. In these beginner videos, you may grow tired of hearing me say these three elements, but they are by far the most fundamentally important sort of predicate photography things that you need to know and put into application every time you shoot. Learning these things not only makes it easier to shoot, makes it less frustrating, and thereby makes it a lot more fun when you can just quickly look at an image and be able to tell what's wrong with it and how to fix it. I know I spent for a long time, months, going, you know, damn it, like, why can't I get this shot? Why is it blurry? Why is it too dark? Why blah, 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 just insert whatever. And I didn't know because I didn't start with the fundamentals. And not only was that because I was just in a rush to jump into it and become a great photographer, I thought that if you got a big fancy camera right away, you would be able to take big fancy photographs. And that was obviously not the case. That combined with the fact that there wasn't a boots on the ground, roll your sleeves up, very beginner lesson available to me. I bought the Four Dummies books. I did all the research I thought I could, but everyone just sort of collectively assumed that I had some modicum of knowledge to begin with, and that just isn't the case. And so you'll have to forgive me if you already know a lot of this stuff. I promise there will be videos for you. Um, if you already know this, it's a good refresher. Otherwise, check out uh, some of my other videos. And I promise I will be doing a mix, but to continue on with my promise from my last video on the one thing you need to be doing to become a better photographer, which I will link right here. I promised that I would do a little bit more of an in-depth sort of deep dive on these three guys. So without further ado, let's talk aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. So shutter speed. Shutter speed, when we're talking about it or when it's on paper, is expressed as a fraction. So say 1 over 320th of a second. And this is important for when we want to slow down motion. So we could be filming a sporting event. If we want to catch that and freeze that in time, we want to have a faster shutter speed in order to do that and ensure that our picture is not blurry in the process. So what happens when we have a higher shutter speed, say one over 320 as opposed to one over 60, is it opens and closes the shutter super, super fast thereby grabbing that image and preserving it in time. So say we take the opposite and take our 1 over 320 and drop it down to 1 over 60. What that's going to do is slow the shutter, how fast it opens and closes, and it's also not going to be moving fast enough to catch something moving within the frame. So it's actually going to let your, you know, say I'm doing a jumping jack, it's going to let your limbs move within that frame, and it's not going to be able to capture it as a sharp image in time. Uh, that's where you're gonna introduce blurry photos. So with one over 60, the shutter is gonna open and close over a longer period of time. It's not gonna be opening and closing as fast as it would be with something like one over 320. With a fast shutter speed and the waterfall, it's going to slow down action in time and you're going to be able to see the, the individual droplets of the water very clearly. But now conversely, if we really slow that shutter speed down to say one half of a second as opposed to one three twentieth, it, you're going to get some image blur and in this case, sometimes we want this. I'm, I know I'm still working to master it, but it's gonna make the water, as opposed to being able to see each individual droplet, it's gonna actually make it look smooth, like this photo here. So I think the bottom line here with shutter speed is if you wanna catch something that's moving in time, 
and you want a clear, crisp image of that, we are gonna increase the shutter speed so it opens and closes in time a lot faster than would a slower shutter speed, which would introduce again that, that photo blur. So say you're at a kid's basketball game, you want a clear picture of them taking a shot, you're gonna speed up that shutter speed and as a result, you'll have a clear picture of them uh, making the game winning basket or whatever they do. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you here on my other camera. My shutter speed is right here. You see it expressed as a fraction. And on my camera, everyone's gonna be a little bit different, but just the factory presets on this allow me to change my shutter speed on this back dial. So if you'll look, we can either go this way and increase the shutter speed or this way, and we can go ahead and slow it way down. Now you've probably heard the term F stops before, and that's how we express aperture. So it's F slash whatever the number is. So it could be F, come on Sharpie, slash four to F slash 16. And that's how we are going to express aperture. That's how you'll see it expressed on paper. And also hear of it as F stops because we like to have five different words for the same concept. Keeps the riffraff out. Is expressed in a backwards fashion, right? So the higher the number, the smaller the hole, the less light that gets let in. And Aperture does essentially two things. It lets light in so you can get a nice bright photo, and it also controls what we call the depth of, of field and what that means is it controls what's going on in the background of your photograph. So there's this sexy word that photographers use. It's spelled B-O-K-E-H. We pronounce it bokeh. And what people like, especially say with, you know, portraiture, any portrait of a person, you want to be isolating your subject and you don't really want to see all the background noise that's going on. Although I'm very much in focus, what's going on behind me in this mess in my office, thankfully, is blurred. And that's what we mean by bokeh, is this, this blurry back here, sharp here, blurry back here. Use one for aperture is letting light in. We want our picture to be brighter. We're going to use a lower aperture number. So F2 is compared to F16. You want to let light in. Uh, lower number. If you want to keep light out, say you're shooting on a bright day, uh, then you're going to have a higher aperture number. DOF, as you'll see it expressed, the frame, and we want the whole thing to be clear, crisp, and not have any blurring, we are going to use a higher aperture number. So the good rule of thumb is F8. People seem to think you can shoot everything, capture everything in a clear manner with F8 or even a little bit higher. Now, like this with the video, if you want to introduce some background blur and just have your subject be clear, we're going to lower that number down. And it's, say, around F2 again. The lower that number, the more background blur you're going to introduce. So I'm going to shoot a mountain landscape. I'm going to go for F8, F11, one of the, one of the higher numbers. I'm going to film this. I'm going to go for F2 to F4. So if we look at this photo I'm going to put up, uh, I had the aperture set to f14, which is a super small hole as a small opening of light. We are going to be able to see all the detail in the photograph very clearly. There's not going to be any blurring. However, in photography, uh, we don't always want to do that. So, so if we really want to introduce a lot of that background blur, we're going to what's called open that aperture up as wide as it will go. Now this is obviously going to be dependent on your lenses. I know a lot of mine are either f 1.8 all the way to f you know 4.0, just depending on the lens and and what you use it for. But opening it all the way up is just another way of saying that we are going to drop it down to the smallest number that we can get, and thereby introduce the most light, and that will in turn get rid of all of the detail in the background. So keep me in mind and also the background. I'm going to slowly 
increase my aperture number. So right now it's at 2.8. Here's 3.2. And watch how I'll stay clear, but the background will start to come into focus. 3.5, 4.5, 5.0, 5.6, 7.0, 8.0, 9.0, 10.0, 11.0, 12.0, 13.0, 14.0, 15.0, 16.0, 17.0, 18.0, 19.0, 20.0, 21.0, 22.0, 23.0, 24.0, 25.0, 26.0, 27.0, 28.0, 29.0, 30.0, 31.0, 32.0, 33.0, 34.0, 35.0, 36.0, 37.0, 38.0, 39.0, 40.0, 41.0, 42.0, 43.0, 5.6. Do you see how the background is becoming much more clear? But as an ancillary consequence, notice what happened. I'm getting darker. So in photography, it's much like flying a helicopter. If you're a helicopter pilot, hit me up. I've got some really great analogies that will confuse everybody else. But when flying a helicopter, constant adjustments to your controls. One thing impacts everything else. Same thing with photography. So what we're going to do here, if I'm at f6.3 right now, is I am going to increase my ISO and introduce some additional light. So now you can see me, I'm bright, and you can also see the background. But in filming these videos, I don't want that. So let's get rid of that and watch how my background will blur, but I will also get much too bright. So now down to 2.0, and I'm gonna take that ISO and go down to a reasonable level. And there we go, aperture, simple as that. All right, on to the third one, ISO or ISO. It also stands for something. I don't think that's important, but where this is gonna come into play and the best way to think about it, at least for me, uh, is fake light. I think about it as a supplement to the light that's actually out there. The supplement to say it's getting dark out, say it's a day like today where it's dreary as hell, you want to be able to supplement your light source and ISO acts as a form of fake light. So ISO comes into play mostly in lower light conditions where you need to brighten something up, you can use it as a supplement to the already extant light from a window or being outside or whatnot, but it is fake light. Now with fake anything, uh, too much of a good thing is never really that good. And I'll get into that here in a second. So ISO defined again is the sensitivity of your image sensor to light. And the image sensor is the thing, the actual thing in your camera that is capturing the photo. And ISO is expressed just in straight numbers. So depending on your camera, it will just be 100, 200, 300, and, and that's what it looks like. This is not backwards or tricky. Um, just the lower the number, the less light, the higher number, the more light. As an example, say you're shooting a photograph indoors and you have your shutter speed right where you want it for whatever you're capturing. Uh, say you have your aperture wide open, so you are with that letting in as much light in your camera as you can. But say it's still a little bit dark and you just need to make it a little bit brighter, you can bump up that ISO and introduce the fake light without adjusting shutter speed or aperture again. You can crank up that ISO and introduce a little bit more light into your photograph. And here is my word of caution that I promised earlier. With each incremental step up in ISO, the more light you add, the more you're gonna produce grainy or pixelated images. They look kind of like this. And you'll hear it called noisy images. That's just sort of the photographer's term for images that look grainy. And it, again, is gonna depend on your camera. What I have found is it doesn't matter how great your camera is, if you're cranking up that ISO in order to add a bunch of light that doesn't actually exist, your pictures are gonna be grainy. People say it's better to get a grainy image than to get no image at all. I guess I could argue either side of that, but just know if you're really gonna be cranking up that ISO, you do run the risk of making your images look pixelated and just not as sharp as they should be. I hope this video helped you guys out. If it did, hit that like button. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. And I will see you guys in the next video. See ya.